Hello guys, so this is your Dr. Piri again taking you in physiology. So we are still looking at blood physiology, but today we'll be discussing blood physiology lecture six. So we'll be looking at lecture six of blood physiology. So I hope the other videos that I've already shared with you guys, you are able to follow them. And if you have any question, you can ask those questions. Next time you're going to have an interactive lecture. So in this class, as usual, there will be a number of things that we're going to look at. As you already know, there was a lecture that we looked at hemopoiesis. So this hemopoiesis, we're looking at a different angle of hemopoiesis. What we discussed in hemopoiesis last time, we're looking at erythropoiesis. But today, we will concentrate on white blood cell development, which is called leukopoiesis. So it's also part of hemopoiesis, but in particular, we'll be discussing leukopoiesis, the development of white blood cells. So we'll also look at the functions of white blood cells, and also later on, we'll also look at diseases of white blood cells. So the content of uh, this class, what we're going to look at, the contents. So the first one, we're going to have an introduction to leukopoiesis, the development of white blood cells, then we we'll have slides or two that will look at leukopoiesis and the functions of white blood cells, like I said. Then we'll look at white blood cell counts in the lab now, since you're not having labs apparent to you guys because of this COVID-19. So I've added the slides on how you can do white blood cell count, just like I also added the slide on how you can do red blood cell count. So today we'll be looking at how you can do white blood cell count as well. And after that, we'll also discuss white blood cell disorders. So the disorders or diseases that can affect the white blood cells or the diseases that are as a result of white blood cells. So you remember this slide by now? So there are a lot of blood cells that are found within blood. So what we discussed earlier on, we looked at the erythrocytes or red blood cells. But today in particular, we'll be discussing the white blood cells. So you know to say that according to different stains they pick up, there are five types of white blood cells. So these are eosinophil, basophil, neutrophils. So these that end with a few, we already discussed to say these are called granulocytes because they contain granules inside them. Then we have the granulocytes without the granules inside them. We have the monocytes and the lymphocytes. So this is the topic for today. And then after the white blood cell, we'll later on look at the development of platelets. But today's topic, we're just looking at white blood cells. So stay back and enjoy this class. I hope you'll be able to follow me as I'll be taking you through this lecture six. So, the whole blood, we said is 8% of your body weight, of which this 8% 8 of body weight is divided into plasma and formed elements. So plasma, we said is 55% and formed elements is 45%. So this question came in your quiz. I hope you got that question correct because it was a simple one. So you can see the formed elements here, the 45%. It's divided into a number of cells and also platelets. So like I said, we already discussed the red blood cells. On average, a normal human being should have at least 4.8 to about 5.4 million. It can go as high as 6 million red blood cell per cubic millimeter of blood or per microliter of blood. But since today we are just interested in white blood cells, so you can see here the white blood cells, the normal range is between 500 or 5,000 to 10,000 cells per cubic millimeter of blood or per microliter of blood. So that's a normal range of red blood cells. Certain textbooks will give you a range starting from 4,000 to about 11,000 white blood cells. So these are total white blood cells. You don't differentiate them. But when you do a differential white blood cell count, you can differentiate the different types of white blood cells. So we said we have five major white blood cells, and these, you can see them here. 
So you have the neutral fuels that will give you about 60 to 70 percent, lymphocytes 20 to 25 percent, monocytes 3 to 8 percent, eosinophils 2 to 4 percent, basophils 0.5 to 1 percent. So this is a normal distribution of white blood cells. So the majority of white blood cells are neutrophils followed by the lymphocytes, and then monocytes, eosinophil, basophils. So in certain diseases, you find that these proportions will change. Maybe you can have more of basophils, or you can have more of uh, eosinophils, you can have more of lymphocytes or neutrophils beyond the normal range. So we'll discuss those disorders towards the end of the class. But because of time, so I'm going to split this class again into two videos. So the first part, I'll just discuss the normal leukopoiesis, and then we'll also look at the functions of white blood cells. And then the part two of this video, we're going to look at white blood cell counts and also disorders associated with white blood cells. So let's proceed. Introduction, leuco leukocytes. So what are leukocytes? I've already told you to say, the first part that we're going to discuss is leukopoiesis. So what are leukocytes? White blood cells are nucleated cells that have an origin in the bone marrow, but continue to grow in different parts of the body. So these white blood cells, they are originating from the bone marrow, the red bone marrow, is responsible for production of white blood cells. Then later on, these white blood cells, they can migrate to different tissues. And then there, they can also differentiate into different types of mature cells, white blood cells that will have a particular function. For instance, monocytes, when they go to the tissues, they'll become macrophages. And they are involved in phagocytosis. So you can see that after production of these cells or after development of these white blood cells, they are capable of moving to the tissues. Many, they'll be transported by blood. So they need to move into the bloodstream via the pedesis, just like the, white, uh, the red blood cells as we discussed. So they are also capable to move in between the endothelial cells to join the cardiovascular system or the bloodstream. So it's also part of the connective tissue. You know, to say blood is connective tissue. So I find that these white blood cells they can also join other cells in the blood. So they'll be transported as such, and then they'll be able to migrate to other tissues, as we'll be discussing later on. So these white blood cells, they are involved in defense mechanism of the body. So immunity of the, uh, of the body, you're talking about the functions of white blood cells. So we'll go in detail. There's another lecture that is just dedicated to immunology or immunity. So you appreciate this, why I'm saying. White blood cells are the ones that are involved in defense mechanism of the body, especially the lymphocytes. There are two types of different progenitor origin. So you have two types of these white blood cells of two different progenitor origin. So you have the agranulocytes and granulocytes. So the granulocytes, you know, to say they don't have granules. You're talking of monocytes and lymphocytes. Granulocytes, these they contain granules. You're talking of the neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. So these are coming from two different progenitor cells. Remember, after the hematopoietic stem cell divides into multipotential progenitor cell, that multipotential progenitor cell can divide into common myroid cell or common lymphoid cell. The common myroid cell is the one that will give rise to most of these granulocytes, and the common lymphoid cell is the one that will give rise to granulocytes, in particular, the lymphocytes, because the monocytes is also coming from common myroid cell, progenitor cell, or stem cell, if you want. The granulocytes, are so named because of their cytoplasmic granules, which on blood smear stained with gym sustain or right stain appear red. So if they appear red, then they are called eosinophils. Why is because the granules within the eosinophil, they stain very well with the acidic part of the gym sustain or the right stain. So they will pick up the acidic part, which will stain red. 
in general. And then the basal veils, they like the basic part of the stain, so they'll stain blue. Then you have the intermediate that will pick up both stains. So the blue stain and the red stain, so the intermediate becomes pink granules. So within the neutrophils, the granules would appear pink. So these are different types of granulocytes. So we proceed. Indeed, granulocytes are sometimes called polymorphonuclear segmented cells. Polymorphonuclear, it means that the nucleus can take different forms. That's why it's polymorphonuclear cells. So you know to say, for instance, the neutrophils, they have segmented nucleus. So you find that the nucleus of a neutrophil, sometimes it can have two lobes, sometimes three lobes, sometimes four lobes. So it has got multiple structure of the nucleus. That's why they are referred to as polymorphonuclear segmented leukocytes. So these mainly are looking at the granulocytes. So they, are, they have segmented nucleus in some extent. So it will, it will have different shapes of the nucleus depending on the level of development and also the mature granulocytes can also have segmented uh, nucleus. So they are referred to as polymorphonuclear segmented leukocytes. Granulocytes have a brief lifespan in blood, about less than 12 hours. So in general, these granulocytes, they can just survive up at most maybe 12 hours in circulation. But on activation, it can migrate into the tissues. So once they are activated, maybe if there is inflammation, there's an infection, these cells can also migrate into the tissues and then they can become special cells depending on the tissues they are migrating to. For instance, there are also other cells like monocytes that can migrate to the tissues, neutrophils, basophils, depending on the factors that are activating these cells. So they are able to migrate to the tissues. But the gospel here is that these granulocytes, the lifespan is very short, less than 12 hours in circulation. So they need to be removed from circulation after 12 hours because they will become dysfunctional. A granulocytes, they lack granules in their cytoplasm and these will include monocytes and lymphocytes. So these, they don't have granules, like I said. Formation and maturation of white, uh, white blood cells. So the process in which these granulocytes are formed, they are also called granulocytopoiesis. Granulocytopoiesis is the process by which the granulocytes are formed and the three granulocytes, you have the xenophil, basophil, and neutrophils. And then the process by which a granulocytes are formed, it's called a, granulocyto, uh, a granulocytopoiesis. So a granulocytopoiesis is a process by which a granulocytes are formed. Then you have two types of a granul a granulocytes. So these are monocytes and that process is called monocytopoiesis. And then you also have lymphocyte formation. So leukopoiesis depends upon the presence of suitable microenvironment. So you have those stimulating factors. Remember, you have the inducers. So you have uh, uh, growth inducers, and then you also have differentiation inducers that can stimulate the stem cell to differentiate into these white blood cells. So they are regulated by growth factors. For instance, you have for instance, you have this factor. Okay. So you have different types of factors that can stimulate these cells to differentiate. So for instance, you have colon stimulating factor. So you have colon stimulating factor that can stimulate these cells to differentiate into white blood cells. And there are a lot of processes that are involved in development of white blood cells. You have mitosis, whereby a cell can divide into two cells. So this is just proliferation of the cells. Then later on, they can also differentiate into these mature white blood cells. So there are two processes. There is mitosis taking place and also differentiation taking place as you are looking at leukopoiesis. So here is a summary of the diagram of leukopoiesis. So you have hematopoietic stem cell and this hematopoietic stem cell can undergo mitosis to give rise to new hematopoietic stem cell. And these hematopoietic stem cells, sometimes they can undergo apoptosis. 
Then there are factors that will stimulate the hematopoietic stem cells. So you have long-term control, long-term factors that can stimulate this hematopoietic stem cell to differentiate or to proliferate into progenitor cells. So now they will change into progenitor cells and these progenitor cells, you have the two common progenitor cells. We said you have the common myeloid progenitor cell and then there is also a common nephroid progenitor cells. So these progenitor cells, depending on the factors that are stimulating them, they will now differentiate into precursor cells. And these precursor cells are the committed cells. The committed cells are committed to be becoming, in this case, white blood cells. So they will differentiate into mature white blood cells. So at each stage, there are factors that are stimulating these cells to differentiate and also to undergo mitosis. So you can see, as you are starting here, there is a lot of mitosis taking place here to increase the number of cells that will now mature into white blood cells. So you can see here, after a lot of these mitosis taking place here, and then you have differentiation taking place here, so that you have your mature white blood cells that are coming from the same hematopoietic stem cell. So this leukopoiesis is taking place within the bone marrow. So when you have a slide showing a bone marrow, under microscope, this is how you're going to see the bone marrow. So you can see different types of cells that are developing within the bone marrow. So you have components of the bone marrow. You are talking of the red bone marrow. There is the vascular component of uh, the bone marrow or vascular compartment if you want. So this vascular compartment is just extensive network of sinusoids. So you can see the sinusoids. So these are more like tiny, tiny capillaries that are found within the bone tissue. Then you also have hemopoietic compartments. The hemopoietic compartment will contain islands of hematopoietic stem cells that are now developing into these white blood cells. So this is just under microscope. So you can see different types of cells undergoing development. Some of them will become red blood cell, some of them white blood cells, some of them will become platelets, some of them who also become uh, different types of blood cells as we'll be discussing. So let's start by looking at granul granulocytopoiesis. The granulocytopoiesis is the development of granulocytes with the granules inside them. The formation of granulocytes is called granulo. Cytopoiesis. So granulocytopoiesis is the formation of granulocytes. Basically, you're looking at the neutrophil, eosinophil, and basophils. So all the granulocyte progenitor cells are derived from colon-forming cells, stem cell. So this is a stem cell that will form a colon. So it's called colon-forming cells, the colon-forming progenitor cells. And you have different types of these colon-forming cells, depending on the, the cells that they will mature into. So for instance, you have the granulocyte progenitor cells. You have different types of these uh, granulocyte progenitor cells. So they can differentiate into committed cells. And the committed cells here, you have colon forming units, eosinophil. So this will form the eosinophil lineage. So it will develop into a mature eosinophil cell. Then you can also have a committed cell, which is called colon forming unit, basophil. So this will form the basophil lineage. Then you can also have colon forming units, granulocytes and macrophages or monocytes. So you have different types of them, colon forming units, granulos, uh, uh, colon forming unit G that can also stimulate the neutrophil line. Then you can also have the colon forming units, monocytes that will later become the monocytes. So these are different types of committed cells as a result of other factors stimulating the hematopoietic stem cell to differentiate into the progenitor cells, and these progenitor cells will differentiate into uh, the committed cells. And these committed cells are, uh, will, be becoming, will be becoming mature white blood cells. So depending on these committed cells, if you are looking at colon forming unit eosinophil, it means that when uh, this cell mature, it will become the eosinophil. So if you have colon forming unit basophil, it will become basophil. Then you also have colon forming unit neutrophil that will later on become neutrophils. 
So when you're looking at this development of granulocytes or granulocytopoiesis, it's divided into six stages, major stages, but they are things that are taking place within these cells for them to change shape and also to change cell organelles that are found within them as they are differentiating and developing from one stage to another stage. So you have structural changes to these cells. So you're starting with the hematopoietic stem cell that will undergo certain changes. So what are these changes that you can appreciate with regard to granulocytopoiesis? So there is a decrease in cell size. So you know to say that as these cells are developing, they will start as bigger cells and then as they are differentiating, they'll be becoming more specific and smaller in size. So there'll be a decrease in cell size, so a decrease in cell size, condensation of the nuclear chromatin because there's condensation of uh, the nucleus, so there's condensation of the nuclear chromatin, there's changes in the nuclear shape as the nucleus is uh, condensing, you find that it will also be becoming smaller. On top of that, there's accumulation of cytoplasmic granules. So these are structural changes that you can see as the cells are developing. So these are the six different stages of granulocytopoiesis. So you are starting from hematopoietic stem cell within the bone marrow that can differentiate into multipotential progenitor cells and multipotential progenitor cells will differentiate into either common myroid or common lymphoid progenitor cells. And these now differentiate into committed cells. So you can see from the common myroid cell, it will differentiate into myeloblast. And these myeloblasts will differentiate into promyrocyte. The promyrocyte is the one that is going to differentiate into xenophilic or neutrophilic or basophilic. So these stage, the first stages here, you are unable to differentiate these granulocytes. You can't tell the difference because they are all starting from the hematopoietic stem cell, and then they'll undergo this stage, the myeloblast, and then the promyrocytes. At this stage, you can't differentiate them. But from promyrocytes, and then it will become a myrocyte. Once at they reach this stage of myrocytes, then you'll be able to differentiate the three types of granulocytes. So you have the myrocyte that will be eosinophilic, meaning that it will contain these granules that are that have got affinity for eosin, so they are eosinophilic. So now you are able to tell that this eosinophilic myrocyte, it will later on become the mature eosinophil. Then you can see here you also have neutrophilic myrocyte, the neutrophilic myrocyte. Inside the cytoplasm, you have granules that will pick up both the eosinophil and the basic part of the stain. So you find that you have more of pink granules. So you'll be able to tell that this will now mature into a neutrophil. And then down here, you have basophilic myrocyte, the basophilic myrocyte. Inside here, you have granules that will pick up the basic part of the stain. So they will appear blue. So you know to say that basophilic myrocyte, it will mature into a basophil. So these are the six stages. So you have the first one, second one, third stage. Then the fourth stage, you can see here that the myrocyte is differentiating into the meta myrocyte. So you have a xenophilic metamyrocyte. You can have neutrophilic metamyrocytes. You have basophilic metamyrocytes. So from the metamyrocytes, it will differentiate into a stab cell. So you have a xenophilic stab cell. The stab cell sometimes they are also referred to as a band cell. So it can either be called band cells or stab cells. It's just one and the same thing. So you can see stage five here, you have eosinophilic stab cell or a band cell. And this now, it will differentiate into the mature eosinophil. So you can see the changes in the nucleus as the cell is developing. 
So here you have a bigger cell, the promyrocyte. Then there's change in terms of shape, it has become smaller here. At the stage of myelocytes, they're becoming more specific, whether they'll have azonophilic granules or basophilic granules or neutrophilic granules. So at this stage, you can differentiate them now. Then at uh, the, the myelocyte will now differentiate into metamyelocytes. You can also see the change in the nucleus that now there is more like formation of a, uh, a dent here or invagination of the nucleus, like it's about to separate. Then you can see here the nucleus is stabbed. That's why these are called stab cells or a band cell because the nucleus looks like a band and later on it will be segmented. So you can see that you have two lobes in eosinophil. Then in basophil, you can have also three lobes here, but eosinophil and neutrophil, you can have up to five lobes. So you can see here you have one, two, three lobes, but you can even have five lobes in neutrophils. Xenophil mainly two lobes, and basophil, you can also find two lobes or three lobes. So these are the different types of granulocytes. So the six stages of granulocytopoiesis. So the first one, you have the myeloblasts, which is not specific. So it can become basophil, it can become neutrophil, it can become eosinophil. Then the second stage, promyrocyte. The promyrocyte is not specific as well, so you can't tell what mature cell it will become at this stage. But after this, when it becomes a myrocyte, now you are able to tell. So at third stage, you are able to tell for this particular example I'm giving here to become a neutrophil. So it's a neutrophilic myrocyte. So from neutrophilic myrocyte, it will become now a meta myrocyte or a meta neutrophilic myrocyte, meaning that now the nucleus is changing shape becoming more segmented. So you can see the change in shape of the nucleus. So it has become a metamyrocyte. This is the first stage of neutrophil development. And then from there, it becomes a stab cell or a band cell. So these are stab cells or a band cell, but it's a neutrophil, fifth stage. Then from here, in the last stage, you have a segmented neutrophil. Segmented to the sense that the nucleus is segmented. That's the reason why they're also called polymorphonucleated cells, segmented cells, because they have segmented nucleus. But within the cytoplasm, you have these granules. So depending on what part of the stain they will pick, then you have different types of granulocytes. In this case, neutrophil, you can see that the, the granules are pink in terms of color. The basophil, they will be blue. Then the eosinophil, they'll be more red. So that's how you differentiate them under microscope. In conclusion, all of the granulocyte derived from myeloblast. So they are all coming from hematopoietic stem cell and then it becomes a myeloblast. So they are all coming from the myeloblast, which is common to these cells as they are developing. The myelocyte is a stage when three cells of granulocytes can be recognized. So you can only recognize at this stage. This is a third stage in terms of development. So once you have the myelocyte, then you are able to tell whether this myelocyte will become xenophil, basophil, or neutrophil. The maturation process of granulocytes is characterized by the synthesis of azurophilic and specific granules. These azurophilic specific granules is dependent on the type of the granulocyte it will become. So there are certain granulocytes that their granules will be loaded with proteins like defacins and also antimicrobial proteins in case of the neutrophils and also other cells like the basophils, they'll be loaded with the histamine. So these are specific granules now with a specific function for the specific cell. So we'll also look at the different functions of these white blood cells, the granulocytes. 
That's where now I'll specify the function of these granules. Then you can also see the condensation of the nucleus, of course, as changing the cells as they are developing this condensation of the nucleus. The mature granulocyte leave the bone marrow, then they'll enter the circulation, or become part of the connective tissue. So this is called the pedesis. The process by which the white blood cell they will leave the bone marrow to join the bloodstream, I've already explained. So that's it for granulocytopoiesis. So now let's move on to a granulopoiesis. A granulopoiesis simply means the development of a granulocytes. And you have two types of granulocytes, the lymphocytes and the monocytes. So these granulocytes are also derived from colon forming cells. So you have colon forming cell, stem cell, and also colon forming cell lymphocytes. So in particular, the colon forming cell lymphocytes that is developing from hematopoietic stem cell, the hematopoietic stem cell will differentiate into common lymphoid progenitor cell. And the common lymphoid progenitor cell is the one that is now dividing into colon forming cell lymphocytes. So you can see here, colon forming cell lymphocytes. And the other cell, the monocytes, is still coming from the myeloid. Remember, it's still coming from the myeloblast. So that myeloblast can also differentiate into colon forming unit stem cell that is common to granulocytes and one of the agranulocytes, in particular, talking of the monocytes. So the monocyte has got similar origin as compared to the other granulocytes that we've already discussed. So you also appreciate the morphological changes in a granulopoiesis or a granulocytopoiesis if you want. So there's a decrease in the overall cell, the overall cell. So there's a decrease in overall cell and nuclear diameter. So this we've already appreciated to say the cells are becoming smaller. So you find that the cells, the overall cell size will start becoming smaller. And also the nucleus diameter will also reduce because the nucleus is undergoing condensation. So there's also an increase in the nuclear chromatin density. So as the nucleus is condensing, even the density of the chromatin will, will increase. So the density of the chromatin or the DNA material will start increasing. So this is the monoblast. So the monoblast will become the monocytes. So when you're talking of <clears throat> this monoblast, uh, monoblast, you're looking at monocytopoiesis the development of the monocytes is also called monocytopoiesis. So the monoblast will develop into pre-monocytes and then the pre-monocyte will develop into the monocytes later on. So you can see here the monoblast in terms of <clears throat> size it's bigger because this is when it's developing. It's a committed cell that will become the monocyte you have the bigger nucleus and the smaller cytoplasm. So these nucleus with time to be undergoing condensation, so it will become smaller, and then you'll be able to appreciate the cytoplasm as the cell is differentiating. So it's a large cell in terms of size, it's about 15 to 25 micrometer. The nucleus is oval, so you can appreciate the oval nucleus, the cytoplasm without the granule or pure azurophilic granules. So you can see here you can't appreciate any granules or you, can, you will just have few granules, azurophilic granules. Then this will differentiate into pro-monocyte. So it will differentiate into pro-monocyte. The monoblast will differentiate into the pro-monocyte and the pro-monocyte will differentiate into the mature monocyte. Okay, so the monoblast will differentiate into the pro-monocyte, and this will divide twice, then to mature into monocytes. So it will develop into the mature monocytes. Then later on to become the monocyte, bone marrow, and the mature monocytes will enter the bloodstream via the pedesis, then to join the sector, uh, the blood circulation. Then <clears throat> to become part of the connective tissue, of course. 
depending on the tissues they migrate to, they will become macrophages. So these monocytes are the ones that will become macrophages. So it depends with the tissue they migrate to. If the monocytes migrate to the liver cells, they'll become kufa cells or kufa macrophages. If they migrate to the lung, they'll become alveolar macrophages or dust cells. If they migrate to the central nervous system, they become microglial cells that are phagocytic in nature. The lymphopoiesis, now we are looking at development of the lymphocytes, which is different from monocytes. The one that we just discussed it was a monocyte. Now the development of the lymphocytes, we have two different types of lymphocytes and that process is called lymphopoiesis. So this lymphopoiesis, so you have the colon forming unit, lymphocytes that will divide to form colon forming units, lymphocyte B and colon forming units, lymphocyte T. So the colon forming unit lymphocyte is not specific, meaning that it can differentiate either into B lymphocytes or T lymphocytes. But once it differentiates into the colon forming units, lymphocyte B or colon forming, lympho, uh, common colon forming unit lymphocyte T, then it becomes specific to the cells that will develop from there. So we proceed. So the colon forming unit lymphocyte B will migrate to the BASA equivalent location to divide into B lymphocytes. So within mammals or a human being, the BASA equivalent, you know, to say in beds, we have BASA that is located near the cloaca that is involved in the development of these B lymphocytes. But in mammals, there is no cloaca. So it means that the BASA equivalent, these are structures that are associated with lymphoid tissue. So you can have a lymphoid tissue in the GIT, so you have gut associated lymphoid tissue and also other lymphoid tissue like the lymph node so these lympho uh, B lymphocytes they will migrate the colon forming units lymphocyte B they will migrate to those BASA equivalent and then that's where they will mature into the B lymphocytes and these B lymphocytes once they are activated they are the ones that will differentiate into plasma cells and then they'll start producing antibodies or antibodies against pathogens. So we'll discuss that. Then the colon forming units, lymphocyte T undergo mitosis and migrate to the thymus. Then within the thymus gland, that's where they will differentiate into T lymphocytes or mature T lymphocytes. And some of these cells, they are still undergoing complete development within the bone marrow. So you still have the mature B lymphocytes, you still have the mature T lymphocytes that can move from the bone marrow into the circulation. But some of them, they're migrating to these locations to develop into the mature cells, like the thymus and the BASA equivalent location within the body. So within the thymus, you know to say, a child is the one that will have the functional thymus. An adult is vestigial, meaning that it's not functional. So you find that in young people or in children, they will have a thymus that is responsible for development of T lymphocytes. Then later on, it will start reducing. So these lymphocytes, they'll be in circulation. So later on, we'll look at the decussation that takes place, the physiological decussation between the neutrophils and the T lymphocytes, how they swap. Like at birth, we have normal concentration of T lymphocytes and, and monocytes, I mean neutrophils, so neutrophils and lymphocytes. But there'll be time at about five, two to three days, there's a decussation. And then later on in life, there will be another decussation. So we'll discuss that later on. That is called physiological decussation of neutrophils and lymphocytes. So again, here you have a lymphoblast. So you can see a lymphoblast here that is undergoing development. 
and the lymphoblasts will differentiate into lymphocytes within the bone marrow. So you can see the lymphocytes here. So this lymphocyte is the one now that to differentiate into T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. The conclusion here is that leukocytosis or leukopoiesis is the formation of white blood cell that occurs in the bone marrow. The granulocytes and monocytes are derived from the myeloid stem cell, whereas the lymphocytes from lymphoid stem cell. The leukocytosis or leukopoiesis involved the series of mitosis and differentiation. So you have mitosis and differentiation taking place. Leukocytosis or leukopoiesis are regulated by several growth factors and interleukins. So you have growth factors and interleukins, just like the same growth factors that we saw that were involved in regulating erythropoiesis. They are also the same factors that are also involved in regulating leukopoiesis. So this diagram is familiar to you because we discussed this. So you have the anthropoietic stem cell that can undergo differentiation. So it can come the common myeloid progenitor cell or the common lymphoid progenitor cell. But I'm interested with the common myeloid progenitor cell because this is the one that will give rise to granulocytes and one of a granulocytes. So you have the three granulocytes and one a granulocytes, which is Monocytes is still coming from the common myeloid progenitor cell. And then the other granulocytes, which are lymphocytes, are coming from the common lymphoid progenitor cell. So you can see here there are factors like interleukin 1, 3, 6. Then you have granulocytes, monocyte, granulocytes, monocyte or macrophages, colon stimulating factor stem cell factor that to stimulate the hematopoietic stem cell to become the common myeloid progenitor cell, the common myeloid progenitor cell under these factors to become erythrocytes. So this we already discussed, but under the influence of granulocytes, monocytes, colon stimulating factor, it will differentiate into myeloblasts. And these myeloblasts with different combination of these factors it can either become the basophil, neutrophil, eosinophil, or monocytes. The common lymphoid progenitor cell, under the influence of these factors, FLT3 ligand, tumor necrosis factor alpha, TGF, interleukin 2, 7, 12, and stroma derived factor 1. It will stimulate this common lymphoid progenitor cell to differentiate into a small lymphocytes, and the small lymphocyte can differentiate into B lymphocytes or T lymphocytes. So the T lymphocytes is the one that will require a lot of interleukins. So you can see with the presence of interleukin 1, interleukin 2, interleukin 4, interleukin 6, and interleukin 7, it will differentiate into T lymphocytes. So you have the B lymphocytes and the T lymphocytes. The development of these white blood cell is called leukopoiesis. So leukopoiesis, you are basically looking at the development of basophil, neutrophil, eosinophil, monocytes, B lymphocytes, and T lymphocytes. This process is called leukopoiesis. Leukopoiesis is divided into two. So you have granulocytopoiesis and agranulocytopoiesis. Okay, it's the same information here, so we proceed. So you can see the hemocytoblast is a hematopoietic stem cell that you differentiate into two cells. You have the myeloid stem cell, a lymphoid stem cell, same information. So the myeloid stem cell can become the myeloblast or monoblast. Myeloblast will become those granulocytes, the monoblast will become the monocytes. Then the lymphoid stem cell will become the lymphoblast and then to become mature B cell and T cell. So you have mature T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes that are coming from here. So this process, we've already discussed the six stages in which the granulocytes will be developed. So this is called a granulopoiesis, granulopoiesis. So you can see the staining of the granules. So these cells, they have granules. So these are called granulocytes, neutrophil, eosinophil, and basophils. Then here you have the development of the monocytes. 
So the monocytes is stimulated by another factor. So this is just an example of granulopoiesis, the formation of the granules. So you can see within this cell as it's developing, you don't have any granules at this stage of myeloblast. At the stage of promyelocytes, so you can see the appearances of azurophilic granules. So you can also appreciate the Golgi apparatus, so the Golgi bodies that are responsible for production of the vesicles. So you also have rough endopacific reticulum, the Golgi apparatus. Then the Golgi apparatus is the one that will, will now modify these granules. So depending on the type of the granulocytes, you have different types of the granules. The monocytes, the hematopoietic stem cell, under the influence of granulocytes, monocytes, colon stimulating factor, it will differentiate into, into a, and then you can see that this cell here, you have the monocytes colon stimulating factor that is stimulating this cell, and this is a myeloblast, and the myeloblast to differentiate into monoblast, and the monoblast to differentiate into the monocytes, and the monocytes later on within the tissues can, can transform into a macrophage. So depending on the tissue type it's migrating to. For the lymphoid stem cell, it will become a lymphoblast, and the lymphoblast can differentiate into three different types of cells. So you can see the lymphoblast can differentiate into B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, or it can also differentiate into natural killer cell. So a natural killer cell is a special type of lymphocytes because it's also coming from the lymphoblast, but it's different from the B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. It's called natural killer cell is the one that is involved in killing <coughs> cancerous cells. So cancerous cells are killed by natural killer cell and also other cells that are infected by viruses or bacteria. They'll be also killed or removed by the natural killer cell. So we'll look at the function of these cells later on. <coughs> okay, so that brings us to this slide now, looking at the leukocytes functions, the specific functions of these leukocytes. So the five different types of white blood cells, what are the specific functions for these five white blood cells? So in general, first, what are the general functions of white blood cells or leukocytes? So you know to say that these leukocytes are complete cells with the nucleus and organelles. So they do have organelles and they do have a nucleus. Red blood cells, they don't have a nucleus, but white blood cells, they do have a nucleus. So in as much as the cells are developing, we say that the nucleus is condensing, so it's becoming smaller, but they don't eject the nucleus. So there is no ejection of the nucleus in white blood cells. So they will still maintain the nucleus within them. And that will also help you to differentiate white blood cell from red blood cell when you're doing blood cell counts. But what are the general functions of white blood cells? So the general functions of white blood cells, they protect the body against bacteria, viruses, parasites, and cancerous cells. They remove foreign substances such as toxins and waste. They destroy dead, abnormal, and worn out cells. They also participate in inflammatory and immune response. So these are the general functions of white blood cells. So such a question can come maybe in short essay questions to say, can you list the major functions of white blood cells? So it's very easy. You don't even need to study this for you to remember. So they protect the body against bacteria, viruses, parasites, and cancerous cells. They remove foreign substances such as toxins and wastes. They destroy dead, abnormal, and worn out cells. They also participate in inflammatory and immune response. So these are just general function of white blood cell. But what are the specific functions of white blood cell? Starting with the neutrophils. We are starting with the neutrophils. Why is because we said the neutrophils are the first cells that will respond to inflammation 
or infection. So they will be the first cell to migrate to inflammatory tissue or infectious tissue. So any tissue that is infected or any tissue that is inflamed, inflamed you'll find that the neutrophils are the ones that will migrate there first. In terms of quantity, the normal range or the normal count of neutrophils should be between 2.5 to about 7.5 times 10 raised to the power 9 neutrophils per liter of blood. So per liter of blood, you should have 2.5 to 7.5 times 10 to the power 9 neutrophils per liter of blood. So they are the first line of defense, first cells that come to the area of inflammation or infection. This question came in the quiz, so I hope you got it right. So these are the first cells that will respond to inflammation on, and also infection. So they are the first line of defense with regards to cell-mediated immunity. So we have different types of immunity. So with regard to cell-mediated immunity, the neutrophils are the first cells that will respond. So they are the first line of defense. So they are functional cells that attack and destroy viruses and bacteria. So they have different functions. So they can destroy and attack viruses and also bacteria. They are not specific. So they don't just attack viruses. They don't just attack bacteria. So they can attack viruses, they can attack bacteria. That's why they should be the first line of defense to respond to inflammation and also infections because they are able to destroy viruses. They are also able to destroy bacteria. So phagocytosis in nature, meaning that they are involved in phagocytosis. So yes. cellular ingestion of bacteria with enzymes, proteases, peroxidase, cationic proteins. So these are proteins that are found within those granules, the neutrophil granules, the neutrophilic granules. They contain enzymes just like the rhizosomes. So when they internalize a bacteria or a virus, it will fuse with, the, uh, with these neutrophilic granules and then they contain these enzymes that will destroy the pathogen. So they are also phagocytic. They are involved in phagocytosis process. They are microphagocytes, meaning that they can only phagocytose smaller, smaller microorganisms, up to about 15 to 20 micrometer in diameter. So they don't internalize bigger, bigger organisms. So they are microphagocytes. Then there's a reaction which is called respiratory burst. The respiratory burst, also called oxidative burst, is a rapid release of chemicals from immune cells when they encounter with a bacteria or fungi or fungi. So once these cells encounter foreign organisms like viruses, bacteria, or fungi, you find that they are able to produce chemicals and these chemicals they are also called cytokines so they will be able to stimulate other cells or to mobilize other cells to come to the site of infection or to come to the site of inflammation via the release of these chemicals so other cells will be able to follow the concentration gradient of these chemicals to be able to locate where inflammation is taking place, where an infection is taking place. So this movement of cells down the concentration gradient of chemicals like cytokines, is called chemotaxis. So it's called chemotaxis. So they're able to produce interleukins. They're able to produce cytokines. that will be able to signal other cells to come to the, to the location of inflammation or location of inflammation or infection. So this is called respiratory best. So it's called respiratory best because you synthesize a lot of these chemicals and then release them.
Moving on to the basal fields, so in terms of number of basal fields, you should be able to find about 0 0.01 to about 0 0.1 times 10 raised to the power 9 per liter of blood. So you should have 0 0.01 to about 0 0.1 times 10 raised to the power 9 basal fields per liter of blood. So they are not as much as the neutral fields. Remember, the neutral fields were more. The major function of basal fields mainly, you know, to say they contain a lot of histamine, so they produce histamine and they also contain heparin. So the basal field, they contain mainly histamine, and histamine is a vasodilator, so it's involved in vasodilation of blood vessels. So this is very important when talking of inflammation. Why? It's because once they are activated, the basal fields, they'll be able to release the histamine and the histamine will cause vasodilation. And when you have vasodilation, the permeability of the capillaries will increase or the permeability of the blood wall, the cardiovascular wall, talking of blood vessels, will increase. Once there is an increase in the permeability, other cells will find it easy to move across, to go to the to the location of inflammation or to go to the location of infection. At the same time, there is movement of fluids now from the cardiovascular system to the tissues when you have more of vasodilation. Okay, so that is a function of the basophil. So it means that they are involved in allergic reactions also. Then on top of that, they can also produce heparin. And this heparin is an anticoagulant meaning that if there is damage to the blood vessels or maybe there is clotting taking place, they are able to produce heparin to inhibit clotting of blood or to inhibit the formation of these clots. So that is very important why it's because you know to say when there is damage, there's a lot of formation of clots and these clots, they can block blood vessels. So because you want fluids to move into these tissues, so you need the blood vessels to be open. So heparin will, will function as anticoagulant to inhibit that. Basophils, they also contain IgE. So because they contain IgE, it means that they participate, they participate in allergic reactions because IgE, is associated, is associated with allergic reactions. So because it contains IgE, then it participates in allergic reactions along with the mast cells in the tissues. So they're also involved in allergic reactions. That's why they also produce a histamine for vasodilation. On top of that, they'll promote function of other leukocytes or other white blood cells, why it's because they're also causing vasodilatation. So it will be very easy for these cells to move across the blood vessel wall to go into the tissues. So they can also promote the function of other cells. They can also produce certain chemicals that can attract other white blood cells to move to the site of infection or whatever it is, or inflammation or allergic reaction that is taking place. Excuse me. Eosinophils, in terms of numbers, you should be able to find 0 0.04 to about 0 0.4 times 10 is to the power 9 eosinophils per liter of blood. So that's the normal number of eosinophil counts. In terms of function, eosinophil, many, you know, to say that once you see eosinophil, then think of parasites or infection. So they migrate to the site of infection. They are weak phagocytes, meaning that they are not entirely involved in phagocytosis. But besides that, they are able to produce certain proteins against parasites like worms and other parasites. So they are antiparasitic cells. So because they can produce or they can kill parasites, including worms, so they'll produce proteins against these parasites. That's why they are called antiparasitic cells. So they are not mainly involved in phagocytes because these parasites are so big, they are bigger than the, the cells themselves. So they can't internalize these parasites. The best they can do is just produce proteins against them that can attack these worms and other parasites. 
So they contain an enzyme, and this enzyme is called histaminase enzyme. So histaminase enzyme is an enzyme that breaks down histamine. So because it can break down histamine, it means to some extent its function, it's opposing that of a basophil. Remember the basophils, they produce histamine. And this histamine is a vasodilator. So if eosinophil is destroying the histamine because it contains the enzyme histaminase, so it's going to reduce allergic reaction. So if you have a patient with allergic reaction and you, you want to minimize or to, to make sure that that allergic reaction doesn't become severe, you can also give a lot of eosinophils. And these eosinophils, they will produce histaminase and the histaminase will reduce allergic reactions. But it's not necessarily important for you to transfuse eosinophils into a patient just because of allergic reactions, because there are a lot of drugs that can take care of these allergic reactions or by giving the same enzyme, the histaminase that will destroy the histamine, then that will reduce the allergic reaction as a result of the basophils that are also producing a lot of histamine. Eosinophilia is just an increase in the level of eosinophil in the blood. So this condition we'll discuss when we start looking at disorders of white blood cells. So just know that eosinophilia is an increase in the level of eosinophil. And this can also indicate parasites. So if you have worms like flukes or whatever it is, worms in the GIT, you expect that the eosinophil count to increase, and that will predispose you to this condition, which is called eosinophilia or eosinophilia. Monocytes. In terms of numbers, should find 0 0.2 to about 0 0.8 times 10 raised to the power 9 monocytes per liter of blood. So that's a normal monocytes count. In terms of functions, you know, to say monocytes are the ones that will become macrophage. Macrophages are involved in phagocytosis. But here now, the monocytes are bigger than the neutrophils, so they are able to internalize bigger organisms or bacteria or viruses. So they differentiate into macrophages, which can phagocytose up to 100 bacteria. So they are going just to differentiate into macrophages, and these macrophages, one macrophage is able to internalize about 100 bacteria. So you can see that they are bigger as compared to mono uh, neutrophils. So there are antigen presenting functions. So we have antigen presentation function. So there are antigen presenting cells. So they are able to present the antigen to the lymphocytes that will result into activation of lymphocytes. So monocytes, they are also involved in activation of lymphocytes. Why? It's because they are antigen presenting cells. So once they internalize the bacteria, they will destroy this bacteria and the component of the bacteria will be presented within the plasma membrane of these monocytes. Then they'll take that component and present it to the lymphocytes. Then the lymphocytes will be able to recognize the bacteria. Then it will mount an immunity against it. Some of them will start producing antibodies against the bacteria. Some of them will go and attack the bacteria because they are able to recognize that bacteria after antigen presentation. And that we will look at when you start looking at immunology. So these monocytes, there are different names for monocytes depending on the tissues they move to. So we have wandering, wandering uh, macrophages or monocytes. So these are just wandering within the tissues. So these are the ones that go to the site of inflammation. So they are called wandering macrophages. So depending on the tissues they migrate to, you have different types of monocytes. Like I said, you have the kofa cells within the, the liver. So in the liver, you have the kofa cells, you have the alveolar macrophages in the lungs. Then you have microglial cells within the central nervous system that will function as phagocytes to internalize bacteria within the central nervous system and also to get rid of cell debris or damaged cells 
or odd cells within the central nervous system. Then within the tissues, like in the muscles, you can also have macrophages. So they can transform into those cells. Now let's look at the function of lymphocytes in particular. In terms of numbers, lymphocytes should find about 1.5 to 3.5 times 10 raised to the power 9 lymphocytes per liter. So lymphocytes, in terms of numbers, the neutrophils are more than the lymphocytes. So lymphocytes, second in terms of numbers of white blood cells. That's why you can see here, it's between 1.5 to about 3.5 times 10 raised to about, times 10 raised to power nine lymphocytes per liter. So what would be the function of lymphocytes? So these are the ones that are purely involved in immunity. So they will provide immunity to the body. So cell mediated immunity. So you have two types of lymphocytes, B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. So the B lymphocytes, they are involved in tumoral immunity. B lymphocytes, tumoral immunity. T lymphocytes, they are involved in cell mediated immunity. So the B lymphocytes, like I said, they will provide tumoral immunity. Tumoral, it means fluids. So the B lymphocytes, once they are activated, they will differentiate into plasma cells and the plasma cells will produce antibodies and these antibodies are found within body fluids, hence the name tomorrow immunity. T lymphocytes, they provide cell mediated immunity. So this is where you have antigen presenting cells that are presenting the antigen to the T cells and the T cells will be activated. And once they are activated, they'll be able to recognize the microorganism or the pathogen for them to attack them. And B cells differentiate into plasma cells, which further produces five classes of antibodies that provide immunity. So once the B cells are activated, they will differentiate into plasma cells, and these plasma cells will produce five classes of antibodies. Remember the five classes of antibodies? So look at them, IgG, IgM, Ig. So all those, we'll look at them, the five classes of antibodies when you start looking at immunity. Then we also have T cytotoxic cells. The T cytotoxic cells, they aim to eliminate virus infected cells, cancer cells, and also causes graft rejection. So when you have a transplant, or whatever it is that you are getting from one person to another person, whatever tissue, grafts rejection is caused by T cytotoxic cells. So these are able to destroy any cell that is infected by a virus. So if a virus is hiding within a cell, the cytotoxic T cells are the ones that will destroy those cells. So they'll produce certain chemicals that will stimulate apoptosis of these cells. So we we'll just stimulate apoptosis in this cell and then the cell will undergo apoptosis. And those apoptic bodies will be phagocytosed by macrophages and then they'll be destroyed by the lysosomes that are found within uh, macrophages. Then they're also able to destroy cancer cells. So cancerous tissue that is developing within the body, the cytotoxic T cells are the ones that will attack the cancer cells. And they can also cause graft rejection. So sometimes you can have a transplant, maybe it could be a skin or a graft. Then these cells, they will recognize that tissue as a foreign tissue, then they can fight that by stimulating apoptosis in those cells, then that can result into a reaction. Moving on to the natural killer cells, Natural killer cells. So we say natural killer cells are special types of lymphocytes. So they are also differentiating from the lymphoblasts. Then they'll become natural killer cells. So from the name itself, a natural killer cell, you know to say that this cell is equipped with cell organelles and other proteins 
that will kill other cells, especially cancer cells and bacteria or virus infected cells. So we're talking of microbial infected cells, they will be killed by the natural killer cell. So this natural killer cell, the natural killer cells kill host cells infected by intracellular microbes. So all cells that are hosting intracellular microbes will be eliminated or it, they will be killed by natural killer cell. Hence, they're involved in eliminating reservoirs of infection. So some of these infections, they not to say they can hide within the host cells, but the natural killer cells, even if the microbes are hiding within these cells, are able to detect them and destroy those cells that are hosting the microbes. So they are involved in eliminating reservoirs of infection. So they are very good when it comes to uh, ending an infection or resolving an infection. Because once you have natural killer cells, they will be able to identify the cells that are infected with the microbes, be it a bacteria or a virus, and then they can initiate processes that will end, will end up killing those cells. So the natural killer cells, they secrete interferon, interferon gamma. So you have the interferon gamma that are produced by the natural killer cell in response to interleukin-12. So the interleukin-12 is produced by a macrophage. So a macrophage that is infected with a microbe or infected with a virus or a bacteria, it will produce interleukin-12. Interleukin-12, it will go and activate a natural killer cell to produce interferon. The interferon now will later on help the same macrophage to destroy the internalized microbes. So it's a communication between cells. So you have the interferon that will activate the macrophages to kill phagocytosed microbes. So you can see in this diagram here, you have the natural killer cell that is able to bind to major histocompatibility complexes that are found on these cells. And these cells are infected by a virus or a bacteria. So we have a virus infected cell that is presenting an antigen. So it's more like an antigen presenting cell here. So the natural killer cell will be able to bind to those receptors then it can initiate apoptosis of this cell that is infected with the virus. So this cell will undergo apoptosis. Then you can see macrophages will be able to internalize the apoptic bodies that are coming from this cell that is undergoing apoptosis. So the virus here or a bacteria will be thinking that is hiding within the cell and this cell is undergoing apoptosis. By the time they are realizing, they will fuse with a rhizosome of a macrophage. And then they'll be digested by those enzymes that are found within a rhizosome. Remember, rhizosomes, they contain enzymes that are capable of digesting anything, be it carbohydrate, lipid, protein, or nucleic acid. So these bacteria will be subjected to those enzymes that will be able to digest them or to destroy them. At the same time, I've told you to say there is a communication between a macrophage that has internalized these microbes with the natural killer cell. So the first thing is that the natural killer cell will go and bind the receptors on the macrophage. The macrophage will produce interleukin-12. The interleukin-12 will go and activate the natural killer cell. Then in return, the natural killer cell will produce interferon gamma. The interferon gamma will now help the macrophage to destroy the internalized or phagocytosed microbes. So you can see now that this macrophage has been turned into a killing machine that is capable of destroying the microbes within the macrophage itself. So killing of phagocytosed microbes, it requires the presence of interferon gamma that is coming from the natural killer cell but for the natural killer cell to the natural killer cell to produce the interferon gamma it needs to be activated by interleukin 12 so you can see the interleukin 12 that is also coming from the macrophage so this is communication between cells making 
in collaboration to destroy these microbes. Then we also have other cells, dendritic cells. The dendritic cells can either come from the common myeloid stem cell or common lymphoid stem cell. So common myeloid stem cell, common lymphoid stem cell can differentiate into a pro-dendritic cell. Then the pro-dendritic cell can differentiate into the dendritic cell. And these dendritic cells are special types of cells the name itself, dendritic, is because of their appearances. According to its morphology, it has got dendrites like a nerve cell. No nerve cells, they have dendrites. So because it appears to have those projections or dendrites, hence the name dendritic cell. But this dendritic cell is a special type of white blood cell. So it's a special type of white blood cell that is also involved in immunity of the body or defense mechanism of the body. So like I said, dendritic cells named because of their many long, narrow processes that resemble neuronal dendrites, which make them very efficient in making contacts with foreign materials. So because these dendritic cells, they have a lot of these projections or dendrites, they are able to detect foreign organisms within the body. So they have these projections that can act like antenna of insects. You know, insects, they have antenna projections, and these antenna of insects, they are able to pick up vibrations in the air so they can sense danger, or they can sense uh, maybe another insect which it can attack. So even these dendritic cells, they also have the dendrites, and these dendrites are able to detect the presence of microorganisms. In this case, it could be a virus or a bacteria, or it could be a parasite. So they are very good at detecting foreign material because of the dendrites. So they are present within the skin, the langer hand cells, the mucosa, and there are four different types of dendritic cells depending on their locations. So you have langer hand cells, you have interstitial dendritic cells, there are myeloid cells that are found within the bone marrow. Then there are also rhymphoid dendritic cells. Rhymphoid dendritic cells they are found with, associated with uh, lymphatic tissue, or the lymph nodes, the thymus, you can also find them there. Or the basal equivalent areas within the mammals, you can also find these dendritic cells. So you have a lot of dendritic cells that are also within the skin, because you know that the skin, they, they could be an opening within the skin that can introduce uh, bacteria or whatever pathogen that can get into your system. So they will find these cells that are equipped with, with organelles to destroy them. So they are also found, a lot of them within the skin. So they are important for presentation of antigens to T cells. So they are also antigen presenting cells. So once they internalize these pathogens, they are going to digest that pathogen and the component of pathogen will be presented within the major histocompatibility complex protein class two. So these dendritic cells, they express this protein the major histocompatibility complex protein class two. We're going to, to discuss different classes of these major, histocom major histocompatibility proteins that are associated with these immune cells. So they are able to present, to present the antigen to the T cells for the activation of the T cells. So like I said, they are important for presentation of antigens to T cells during the primary immune response. They are bone marrow derived cells that express class two major histocompatibility complex protein, and they present antigen to CD4 T cells. CD4, CD4 stands for cluster of differentiation type four T lymphocytes. So these lymphocytes have cluster of differentiation type four, so this class of differentiation, there are a lot. You can have class of differentiation four, class of differentiation five, six, eight, but the common ones are cluster of differentiation four, T lymphocytes, 
There's also a class of differentiation, eight T lymphocytes, which is also called cytotoxic T cells. So those, we also discuss them when we start looking at immunity. So once they present these antigens, then there will be activation of CD4 T cells. So this CD4 T cells is the same cell that is being destroyed with by the HIV virus. Remember the HIV virus is destroying the immune cells, in particular, the cluster of differentiation for T lymphocytes. So once these cells are destroyed, their numbers will reduce. So once you have reduction in CD4 T, then you have a reduction in CD4 count. Once you have a reduction in CD4 count, it means that you don't have sufficient number of T lymphocytes that can be activated and then they'll be able to fight, could be a virus or a bacteria. That's why HIV is very dangerous because it's attacking the immune cells that are involved in defense against these microbes. But the dendritic cells, they have little or no phagocytic activity. So they have little or no phagocytic activity but they are involved in antigen presentation to the T lymphocytes. This diagram or table is just summarizing certain conditions that is associated with elevation in certain white blood cell types. So there are certain selected conditions that will result into a particular type of white blood cell count to increase in circulation. I remember there was a student who asked a question to say, if you have fungal infection, what kind of white blood cell are going to increase in circulation? So there is the day that I'm going to answer that question. So let me just summarize this table. So you can see here, white blood cell line that will increase and the conditions that will stimulate these cells to increase. So because there are particular conditions that can stimulate a particular white blood cell to increase in circulation, it means you'll be able, by looking at the number of white blood cells, those that have increased, you'll be able to predict or to come up with a diagnosis with certain diseases. So let's look at conditions that typically cause elevation of white blood cell or a specific white blood cell. So if you have a condition that will cause an increase in basophils. What are some of these conditions that will cause an increase in basophils? Of course, we said basophils, they are involved in allergic reactions. So all allergic reactions or conditions, allergic react, uh, conditions will stimulate more production of basophils. Why is because you need the basophils in allergic reaction to produce histamine that will cause vasodilation and vasodilatation will result into movement of other cells to the sites. So the permeability of the cardiovascular system will, will increase with basophils. So you find that basophils will increase in allergic conditions. Leukemias, leukemia is just cancer of the blood. And these leukemias can result into a general increase in white blood cell. So we'll look at leukemia. So in leukemia, you can also have an increase in basophils and other white blood cells. Then if you have an increase in eosinophil, that will tell you to say you have allergic condition, dermatologic conditions, eosinophilic, esophagitis, idiopathic, hyper eosinophilic syndrome, malignancies, medication reactions, parasitic infections. So the most common is parasites, so parasitic infections. When you have parasitic infections, you have an increase in eosinophil. Even also when you have allergic reactions, dermatological conditions, eosinophilic, esophagitis, idiopathic, hyper eosinophilic syndrome, all these conditions will point to an increase in eosinophils. If you have an increase in lymphocytes, what can conditions? You have acute or chronic leukemia. Like I said, leukemia, you have a general increase in white blood cell because it's cancer of the blood. Mainly looking at leukocytes, that's why it's called leukemia. So in leukemia, you have an increase in white blood cell counts. 
So you have basal fuels that are increasing and also lymphocytes, so increase in leukemia. So conditions like acute or chronic leukemia, you have an increase in lymphocytes, hypersensitivity reaction, infections like viral and petasis. Petasis, you can also have an increase in uh, leukocytes. Then monocytes in autoimmune diseases, you can have an increase in monocytes. So autoimmune diseases, infections like Epstein, Barr virus, and also fungal infections, protozoan infection, rickettsia infection, tuberculosis, and splenectomy. Splenectomy is a procedure whereby you remove a spleen from a patient or from a person. So in splenectomy, you expect an increase in monocytes. Why? It's because the spleen is the one that is involved to remove monocytes and other white blood cells. So if you remove the spleen, then there is no destruction of the aged monocytes. So you have an increase in monocytes and also other white blood cells. Neutrophils, when you have an increase in neutrophils, mainly you not say there's an infection. So you can have bone marrow stimulation that can result into neutrophils increase. For instance, when we're looking at polycythemia, polycythemia vera, we say that this is a disorder with the hematopoietic stem cell that will result into an increase in the production of red blood cells and also other white blood cells. So in that case, there's bone marrow stimulation because of maybe cancer or a mutation that can result into an increase in neutrophil. So you have an increase in neutrophil in bone marrow stimulation or any other factors that are stimulating the bone marrow. In chronic inflammation, you expect an increase in neutrophils because where there's inflammation, it could be that there's an infection. So you need the neutrophils because they are phagocytic in function and they also produce defenses against the viruses and bacteria. Congenital infection can also cause an increase in neutrophil, medication induced reactive and also splenectomy. Splenectomy, remove the spleen, that can also result into an increase in neutrophils because there is no spleen to remove the aged neutrophils. Because of that, there will be an increase in neutrophils, which is called neutrophilia. So you can have neutrophilia, you can have monocytophilia, you can have lymphophilia, lymphocytosis, if you want monocytosis, basophilia, eosinophilia. So these are the conditions in which you have an increase in white blood cell, depending on the condition. So these are the just general conditions. So coming to that question that the student asked to say, in terms of fungal infection, what type of cells are you going to find? Then what cells are going to increase? What, what types of white blood cells are going to increase when you have fungal infection? So here, you have already seen to say, when you have fungal, you have an increase in monocytes. So there is a combination of monocytes, macrophage, and neutrophils. In fungal infection, you find that there will be an increase in monocytes, macrophage, and neutrophils. Remember, the monocytes will differentiate into macrophage. If you have an increase in monocytes, you expect an increase in macrophage as well. And on top of that, there will be also an increase in neutrophils. Remember, Fungi is so big that it can't be phagocytosed by macrophages. So you need proteins that can be produced against the fungi that is developing. So the neutrophils are also able to produce certain proteins against the fungal infections. So you have an increase in monocytes, macrophage, and neutrophils in case of fungal infection. Okay, so this is the end of the first part of the lecture. Then we'll have the second part, the lecture. 
The second part of the lecture, I'll look at blood cell, white blood cell count, white blood cell count, and disorders associated with white blood cells. So this is where I'll end the first class. Thank you very much.